Hello, and welcome to the virtual worship service of the First Presbyterian Church of Gainesville, Florida. We are glad that you made time to be with us today. We are still in our COVID-19 protocol. Uh, our pews are empty today, but many around our city, our state, and even the world are gathering with us today to worship our King Jesus. We have a few announcements as we get going. Uh, first of all, we extend our sympathy and offer the prayers of our congregation to Del Bowman upon the passing of her husband, Bobby, who joined the church triumphant on May 9th, 2020, and services for Bobby will be private. Uh, we have some meetings this week that you can be involved with related to our parking lot. There are going to be uh, Zoom or call-in meetings. You can do uh, join them either way. The first one is on Monday, May 18th at 3 p.m. And the second one is on Tuesday, May 19th at 7 p.m. For either of those, you need to RSVP. So either uh, contact Fred Lundy uh, individually by his cell phone or his email address or call the church and we can get you connected with Fred. Nominations are due Sunday, May 17th for elders, deacons, and trustees, class of 2023, and the Congregational Nominating Committee, class of 2021. We will uh, take communion together at this service, so uh, make sure by the time we are there, you have the elements, uh, some kind of solid and some kind of liquid to consume uh, during that time. I also uh, want to remind us that the church office remains closed to all visitors. It's only open for staff, and we ask you to help us not have one of those uncomfortable situations where we have to let you know that we can't let you in. Let us continue to worship the Lord.
Please join me in our call to worship and the opening hymn number 32, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. If you're following along in the worship guide, the hymns can be found after the worship order in the PDF. The Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? Please join me for a time of confession and pardon. Brothers and sisters, God not only asks us to repent, but also assures us of forgiveness. Therefore, let us confess our sin to one who is steadfast in love. Join me. Loving God, we do not always keep your commandments. We fail to love you. Our conscience is not clear. Wash us in the water of life that we may live again through the grace and mercy of Jesus, our resurrected Savior. Now, O Lord, transform us as we continue our confession in silence. Sisters and brothers, God forgives, he restores, and strengthens us through the risen Christ. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, our helper and advocate. Open our hearts and minds this day. Entice us with your present. Spark us with a word of life, a message that we may share with ourselves as we seek to live Christ's love in the world. All this we ask in the name of God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us. Amen. Today's gospel reading is from John chapter 14, verses 25 through 31. Please hear the word of the Lord. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away. I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer touch, talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us be on our way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We now invite you to a point in the service where we hold space for a lesson dedicated to our children. Please join me for our time for young disciples. I wonder how many of you who are joining us this morning have ever lost your school shoes. When we were still trying to make it to school before the bells rang, I wonder how many of you woke up in the morning and got dressed really quickly and then spent the next hour 
searching for your shoes. Well, that's me. <laughs> that's been me my whole life. I was always the one that couldn't find their shoes and still sometimes am. I'm guilty of that. At times, my parents were so mad at me and they were so frustrated because we were running late and I really just wish that I had had a helper with me. It's hard to remember things sometimes, isn't it? Let's reread John 14, 26 again. It says in here, but the advocate or helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all I have said to you. See, God knew that sometimes it's really hard to remember things, even his words. So what did God do? He promised us that the Holy Spirit would come help us remember things that are important to God. We need him. He will help bring our remembrance of God's word. But we have to know it before we can remember it, right? You can't remember something that you don't know. A few weeks ago, Mr. Andy stood right here and encouraged us to begin each day by planting scripture verses in our heart. Today, I want to encourage you to keep going. I'm going to resend his list of Bible memory verses in our weekly dose of digital discipleship email tomorrow in case you need that list to look at, or you might have some scriptures that you already have in mind to start remembering. As you continue to plant scripture in your heart, you can ask the Holy Spirit to bring God's word to your memory when you need help. Maybe you need help remembering not to fear, or that you are loved, or that you're not alone, or even just a simple reminder that God is with you. Wherever you're finding that you need help this week, I hope you'll ask the Holy Spirit to remind you of all of God's promises. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you, thank you for sending help. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Help us remember your promises. Guide us when we are afraid. Give us your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our Old Testament reading and preaching text comes from Psalm 27. You are welcome to follow along in your Bibles at home or in the uh, text that is printed in your bulletin or just listen. Psalm 27 of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your ways, O Lord. And lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. We are continuing on our series looking at some of the biblical passages that concern fear. If we were to look at every biblical passage that deals with fear, we would be in this series for a long, long, long time. But we are going to, so we won't look at them all, but we're going to look at several different ways the Bible speaks of this complex issue of fear, an issue all of us face. A well-written argument, whether in a book or in a lawyer's speech or even a sermon, often takes a familiar structure. It makes a claim, and the rest of the words that are written or said build the case for the initial claim. Our text today follows that structure. It makes this huge claim And then it retells the experience of a person that has learned to trust in God as evidence for its claim. Our psalm today, Psalm 27, is attributed to King David. David was a person who had some of the best and worst experiences life has to offer. He was someone that had amazing experiences with God, but someone who also failed God regularly and in powerful and in public ways. Make no mistakes. God is the hero of the Bible. Every other biblical character falls short. But we can learn a lot from God's faithfulness to David through David's triumphs and his failures. Psalm 27 begins with the truth statements about who God is in relation to us humans. David claims that the Lord is his light, salvation, and stronghold. Let's unpack that a little bit. Remember, we need to understand these things in the context of the author at the time they were written, and then bring them into our day to understand what they mean to us. First of all, light. 
Light is the revealer, the remover of tension. Because in their day, they didn't live in these lit up cities where you can walk down the streets and, you know, um, almost never see the stars for all of the light pollution. They regularly encountered darkness. And when they encountered darkness, there was always a bit of fear. Something might be out there. Something might be coming for you, and you can't see it coming. But the Lord is the light. David also mentions God as the source of his salvation. Now, remember in his day, while this would be uh, protected and delivered, it's not what we normally think of when we run into salvation in the Bible. We probably think a lot more to New, Text, New Testament examples where Jesus is talking about salvation. Here, it merely means to be protected and delivered from oncoming threats, from something terrible, from something earthly rather than eternal. But recognize God is using David's words to have a meaning at this point, but to also point towards a greater truth of our saving, of our salvation beyond death. And lastly, he speaks of God as a stronghold, an impressive fortress like a king's castle or a walled city, something that protects, something that cares for those within its walls. And after David says these things about God, then comes his huge claim. Because of these realities, there is no person or thing that should scare him. Think about that. Because of who God is, there is no person or thing that should bring fear. Before we talk about anything else, we've got to walk into this. Let's redefine it. Believing in God in this way results in an absence of fear. Now, if you're familiar with our worship services, the way we do things, we begin worship services with a confession. Because we believe as we interact with God, as we understand who God is, we eventually look at ourselves and we find ourselves lacking we find ourselves less and so we begin our services with getting everything out on the table saying God we fall so much shorter than you do we are so much less David is saying the same thing we are not like you we uh, still need to deal with fear but after we go through this after we deal with this engage engage it at least we probably don't fully deal with it we're free to be emboldened David is speaking of God as if he is not some distant entity but more like he is an earthly ever-present king and when we act on behalf of this king who should we fear? If he put it into today's vernacular, he might say something like, if you mess with me, you got to deal with him. King David knows a lot about fear. He's been attacked by powerful men and powerful beasts. Some of these men and beasts wanted to tear him lip, limb from limb. Some of these beasts literally wanted to eat him. And still, as he considers the nature and power of his God, he realizes that he shouldn't be afraid. As I was preparing this week, I was thinking about who in our congregation uh, could really understand what this might be like. And I thought of all of you veterans that are part of our congregation. Some of you have had bombs dropped on you. You've been shot at. Some of you came home with difficult physical and emotional in injuries, what would it look like just to have all of that removed as you consider who God is and what God is about? It would be unspeakable, wouldn't it? So often when I use phrases like trust in God, 
what I find myself really saying is, I want God to give me what I want. I'm going to trust that God will eventually um, get in line with my agenda and pour these things that I want out in front of me. But when I consider what King David is saying, it doesn't sound like that at all. He is staring reality in the face. He knows how bad it might be. And he's saying, God's goodness is greater than anything that can be thrown at me. This is the cancer patient after an awful diagnosis that says, I know where this could go, God, but I'm going to trust in you anyway. This is the graduate, the college graduate in 2020 who can't get a job because of COVID-19 and has a mountain of debt and says, God, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I'm going to trust. The reality of God always dilutes the reality of fear. There's a temptation in this text, I think. I think the temptation is to say that this is only referring to our ultimate deliverance in the afterlife. These aren't promises that we can really take seriously today. These aren't things that we can hold on to now. But King David's words don't give us that option. He speaks of being delivered in battle, something he has experienced on a regular basis and will experience again soon. He also speaks of being concealed in a time of trouble. Again, this is something he has experienced before and will experience again. He is challenging us to believe that because of God, there is hope right now, no matter how bad our situation. And sometimes hope is the scariest thing of all. In one of my favorite movies, The Shawshank Redemption, Morgan Freeman's character, Red, reminds his friend Andy Dufresne that hope is a dangerous thing. Maybe you feel this way. Maybe life has continued to hand you difficult experience after difficult experience that tell you you can't hope. You can't have any hope. Your life is not going to turn out in a way that anyone would understand as good. King David has had a lot of hardship in life. And he turns to us with this text and says, God can change this. God can bring hope even out of the worst of circumstances. Not because of who we are, of our gifts and abilities, but because of who God is, how powerful and good. When we read through our text, there was one thing that David was scared about. Did you notice it? His fear was that the relationship between him and God could be severed. That was his really real, real fear, to no longer have a relationship with God. He asks to dwell with God. He asks to behold the beauty of God. And he does this because he sees this as keys to maintaining his original thesis statement. That because of the goodness and power of God, he could not fear. And in a long burst that goes through this text, he literally begs God in several different ways not to be done with him. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn me away in anger. Do not cast me off. Do not give me up. This psalm demonstrates to us that there's only one thing to fear, the loss of connection with God. And our hope in this connection is not because of ourselves, it's because of God himself. All of us likely need to look at what we care about with a new sense of value and understanding. All these things that we think matter have been demoted. All the things that are unrelated to God are less than God. Everything related to God is risen up. So now I think there's a question for us. What lies is our current situation telling you? 
As we deal with COVID-19, what are the lies that we haven't been able to let go of to get around? Is this situation telling us that our financial stability or lack thereof is what defines us? A lot of us are being messed with as our jobs disappear and our retirement accounts dwindle. Maybe this crisis is messing with you as you consider what would happen if this virus got to your spouse, your parent, your grandparent, or if you yourself caught it. As our author moves through this line of thought, he arrives back at a place that is very similar to the place that he began. He believes that he will see evidence of God's goodness in the here and now. That the hope in the Lord that doesn't make all the other cares in the world disappear, but it puts all of the cares of the world in their proper place. That place is in descending order to the relationship with God. Those of you that have had a really tough time in life, David claims that God will show you goodness even in the midst of hardship. The more we understand that God is our greatest need, all other needs go down from Him. Our wants and desires undergo a change. God becomes our greatest want, our greatest desire. And David ends this psalm with a request. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This one fear that we are to possess, this fear of God, allows us to be patient with life as we trust in God for what we need most. Now, don't make a mistake here. This is not a call to passivity, anything but but it's a call to be active because we trust. Wait for the Lord. He is dependable and worth waiting on. Let us pray. Sovereign Lord, you are our light and our salvation, the protection that surrounds us. Do the work in our souls to bring us to believe that because of who you are, we needn't fear. Not only is this virus devouring our flesh, it's devouring our way of life. Even the best stuff, like being together and our ability to help each other. We pray for those in our church and beyond its walls that have been most affected by this situation. We pray for those that know they likely wouldn't live through it, or someone they love wouldn't. Hide them in your shelter, Lord. We pray for the places in the world that are just now facing this virus. We ask that they learn from what other places learned, both through correct strategies and missteps. Bring a new hope and a new trust as we await the day of reckoning that you will bring to COVID-19. Let our trust and hope always be in you, our Lord and our God. Amen. Please join me as we affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, was suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he should come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
We are transitioning into the time where we partake in communion together. So those of you watching at home, please gather your drink and your solid, whatever it is. Uh, some of you, it will be juice and bread. Others, it could be uh, rice and water. Uh, whatever is common in your home is fine. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray in the way that the Lord taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. When I was in seminary, one of the most healing things I ever heard was said by the president of our seminary. At that time, it was Steve Hayner, who was actually a keener lecturer here at this church years ago. And he came to the table, and he said, Am I impressed with my spirituality? No. But I'm impressed with God. We come to this table not because of who we are, of what we have done. There's nothing we can do that allows us to come to this table, but it's what God does in us. The righteous God invites the unrighteous to this table to experience grace and peace and love.
On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant filled with my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. This is Christ's body broken for you. This is Christ's blood shed for your sin. I'm sorry, that was maybe the stalest cracker I've ever eaten in my life, so uh, I'm trying to recover. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, we are thankful for the gift of your Son, Jesus. Give us the grace to fulfill the commitments we have made during this supper. By the power of your Spirit, reveal to us the mind of Christ, so that we may understand the gift you've bestowed upon us and proclaim the message of your gospel to the world. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Take these words. Walk into them. Wrestle with your fear as you wrestle with the goodness of our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine round about you and bring you hope and bring you peace. Amen.
Join us at First Presbyterian Sundays at 8.30 and 10.55 or watch us on My 11 every Sunday morning at 9.00.